Got everybody. All right, fantastic. All right, folks. Glad everybody here. Glad everybody can hear us. Thumbs up. Yes. Steve. Sir. Hello. Perfect. You can hear us. Fantastic. And then I assume all you gentlemen in here can hear us too. All right. Well, I'm glad to have everybody in tonight. We're going to jump right into where we're going. And let's get into our flag salute. Or do we want to do this? How are you doing? Yeah, I did. Come on in, right, right here. Yeah. Put on in. Do it, Paul. Well, we were about to go into our flag salute, so let's just start there. Before you guys sit down. About to go into our flag salute right now. Okay. Perfect. All right. Start it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wonderful. All right. Everyone, find a seat. Everyone, find a seat. Everyone, partner. Come here, hang out. What you guys like to? Maybe that's it up there. All right. Well, like we're saying, glad to get that in. Uh, glad to have everyone in here. Glad to see new faces. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, we're gonna end on some fun topics tonight. We'll obviously go over our, how the food drive went, delivery, and so on and so forth. But we'll speak about that here soon enough. Let's just get into our introductions. We'll start with Raymond, 15 second introduction. Hi, Raymond Foster. I'm president of the Rotary Club of San Dimas and running the technical aspect this evening. Fantastic. Lynn yeah. Johnson, Sat Satellite Club Rotary, also uh, Food Drive Sherpa and Packer. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to wait till you were comfortable. So I wanted to wait till you were comfortable to get you out there. My name is Barry Letzler. I was stationed in the United States Navy. That's it. One. Sir, hop on up here. Me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You're in the group here tonight. <laughs> you think about yourself? Darren Spang, local Covina resident, a uh, fan of uh, our military in the Midway. Um, we're not veterans, but we uh, passionately follow uh, Veterans Affairs. What? Glad to have you. Charlie? You're good? You got it. You partner? Come on up here. I'm Peter Zagorowski. Uh, I got out of the army last August. I lived in Pomona and saw this online and thought I'd be a good place to hang out. Right. Glad to have you. Isabel. Hi, Isabella Foster, current secretary of the Satellite Rotary Club of Military Family Support. And wonderful. And then we'll go to Steve in just a moment. Our speaker tonight, he'll give you all about himself. Uh, he was uh, USS Midway, Captain uh, Steve Anders, uh, United States Navy, retired. And normally this is where we'd read your uh, bio, but it does look pretty fantastic. So with that, I figure that's part of the reason you're here tonight, is to let it inform us about yourself and the program you're part of. So with that said, sir, go right ahead. So how would you like to do the presentation? Will you guys run it or do you want me to do it on a share screen? How are we going to do it? Uh, Usually you would run with what you is you'd have to say about the program you're running, and then we uh, will ask you questions afterwards. No, but I mean, how do you want to do the presentation? It's a it's a PowerPoint. Fantastic! You can come it, pull it on your computer. It, yeah, you should pull it up on your computer, and then as you click through it, we'll see it on our end. Right. Okay. I can do that. Wonderful. Okay. Let's see. All right, we can see it on our end. It looks great. Good. It looks fantastic. I'm, I'm getting ready to do a slideshow here. Give me a break. You, you're doing great, sir. 
somewhere along the line here, I've got to figure out how to get that share screen thing up. Oh, it's up right now, sir. There we go. I had I was blocked out for a minute. I'm sorry. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm I'm happy to be uh, invited to talk to you folks. I was I was your neighbor for 24 years. I lived in West Covina, um, just south of the 10 freeway from 1977 until 2001 when we moved to San Diego. So um, I kind of wanted to be here all the time, but nonetheless, West Covina was a wonderful place to raise my family. And San Dimas was just up the road. And then it became world famous in the movies. So very happy to be able to talk to you guys. <laughs> um, I, I, I happen to be a retired Naval officer. Um, that is not necessarily required to be a speaker or a representative for the Midway. It just happens to be the case. And, um, and so I'm delighted to be able to talk to folks about the USSA, USS Midway Museum, which is an aircraft carrier museum in San Diego. And this is a picture of the Midway at the Navy Pier um, about 2004, about 20 years ago, when it arrived in San Diego. So we're going to talk a little bit for about 20 minutes here about the USS Midway Museum and the Midway's history and how it became to be uh, the most famous ship museum in the world. Is that a good enough introduction or would we like to hear something else? It's fantastic, sir. All right, okay. So, th so, so this is, the, uh, this is the, uh, the, pr the premier, if you will, of the USS Midway. Uh, this is a bow shot of the Midway in her later years as she was configured uh, differently from the way she was built. Um, this, is a, this is about 1980s, the configuration of the Midway by the end of her life. And, it's got, and we include that because it's kind of different from what you're gonna see next. This is the Midway's commissioning in 1945. The Midway was built in, uh, during the World War II and it was built actually for the invasion of Japan, which fortunately did not occur. Uh, it was built as the lead ship of a class of three uh, carriers, um, and it was uh, built in about a year and a half, believe it or not, during World War II. So this is what she looked like when she was commissioned in September of 1945. <clears throat> she was an engineering marvel. She was uh, the largest ship in the world for about 10 years, as a matter of fact, she and her sister ships. And you can see some interesting features about the Midway in this photograph. In fact, look at all the guns that are on board here. They hadn't figured out what the difference was between a battleship and a carrier at that point. She had 145 guns on board. Um, she became an aviation premier, excuse me, aviation pioneer rather, uh, doing a lot of important uh, projects in her first few years, uh, primarily based on the innovations that she introduced in her design. Um, she was she was the first aircraft carrier with a steel flight deck and a steel hangar deck. All the carriers before the Midway were made of wood on their flight decks. And she was about 45,000 tons in displacement, more than three football fields long. <clears throat> Finally, after she got converted, she was about 70,000 tons. And we'll see that in just a minute. So I want to tell you a little bit about what life was like on board an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier is truly a city at sea. What's the population? It's about 4,700 people. Now the crew is about 2,800, but they embark about another 2,000 people that come on board to support the air wing and the admiral staff that, that, that serve on board as well. So here's some crooks that are working on the soup, um, uh, 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 the soup bowls uh, on the Midway, and they're trying to cook up some meals for the Midway. Midway served 13,000 meals per day on four restaurants on board. 12,000 eggs were um, sacrificed every day for the Midway crew. 600 gallons of milk, 1,000 loaves of bread daily. 600 chickens sacrificed themselves for a single dinner. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the city at sea. And yes, it's truly a city at sea. You can probably see all these things that you might see in a small town, a post office, restaurants, churches, police station, fire department, public utilities, theaters, stores, barbershops, TV and radio station, hospital. It had its own airport, but alas, no train station or bus station. 
The Midway was uh, Midway and her sister ships were gas guzzlers. They really they chewed up a lot a lot of fuel in order to provide their mission. Uh, they they burned about 150,000 gallons a day of ship's fuel on the average, and they would refuel and replenish the ship about every four to six days. The Midway could carry two million gallons of ship's fuel and over a million gallons of jet fuel for their aircraft. But everything from perishables to newsprint to dental fillings had to be supplied and replenished on a regular basis. And these supply ships, which you can see in this photograph in the middle of the two of the three ships, carried that, that those supplies. And when they were depleted, they went into port and replenished and came back out and replenished the ships at sea. So this is a fairly dangerous evolution where you replenish the ships at sea side by side with hoses and, and uh, other lines connecting the, the ships for the period of the time that they're supplying each other. Life at sea was, was arduous. It was not very pleasant. There were a lot of people that had pretty difficult jobs. This is one of the individuals working inside a boiler, for example. Um, think of all the jobs in a city from plumber to electrician to surgeon. Many of the jobs were hot, dirty, and worked deep inside the ship. Some of the crew could go days without seeing daylight. The average crew age was only 19 and they could endure a lot of hardship at that age if you remember what it was like when you were 19. Hundreds of workers worked just to keep the city at sea operating. Doctors, nurses, cooks, storekeepers, chaplains, lawyers, weathermen. This is a picture of the laundry. These guys were working in a very difficult location um, providing the laundry and tailoring services for the ship. There were some interesting operations early in the Midway's career. Remember, she missed World War II by about a month. And so afterwards, they figured out what would they do with the Midway? Well, she had an armored steel flight deck. That might be one good thing to do with her, take advantage of that. First thing they wanted to do was they sent her up north to the Arctic. Our former ally, Russia, in, in World War II, um, was becoming a problem as the Iron Curtain fell across Europe and communism um, in, incorporated a lot of the countries that are now our allies. So she was sent in 1946 on a special assignment above the Arctic Circle to operate above USSR in the Arctic Ocean and sail the subarctic conducting near freezing flight operations. Unfortunately, there were not always adequate clothing and a lot of the flight crew suffered frostbite. Uh, they experimented with watertight flight suits and a new uh, aircraft innovation called the helicopter. And helicopter rescues were practiced in the Arctic. It was a huge success. It taught the Navy how to fly among the icebergs. Another cool operation in 1947 took advantage of that armored steel flight deck. Remember, all the carriers before the Midway had wooden flight decks. Wouldn't it be a good idea to launch a missile off a wooden flight deck? So they said, let's try the Midway. She has a steel flight deck. Let's take a captured German V-2 rocket and see if the Midway could fire that vessel, fire that missile off the, off the, off the vessel's deck and see what happened. Well, the, the launching worked okay, but the missile went awry. And as it went off course, the uh, experimenters decided to destroy the missile. So the launch was successful. The Midway was deemed to be a, a good launch point for missiles, but unfortunately this particular rocket didn't go to its target. 1945 to 1954, about a 10 year period, the, the, the Midway operated out of Norfolk, Virginia. It was a Norfolk based carrier operating in the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, showing the flag in Europe. Europe was recovering from World War II and in, force, in, in this Korean War, it was a deterrent for the USSR to encourage them, discourage them from entering the war. So the Midway and her sister ships had nuclear weapons on board and basically had warned USSR, if you attack Korea and enter that conflict, we'll attack you from behind from the Mediterranean with our nuclear weapons. And it was successful. It's kind of interesting. If you notice the vest, you notice the aircraft in this picture down here, there's a very early helicopter and also that multi-engine aircraft, that multi-engine uh, aircraft on board was an, an aircraft that could not actually land on the aircraft carrier. So what they did is they took their normal aircraft off the ship and they put those planes on board with cranes. They put nuclear weapons on them and then they would launch them from the midway. They would go to their mission and fire them or drop them as the case may be. And then they would return to land bases. It was a very unusual 
operation early in the 1950s. Of course, we can neither confirm nor deny that nuclear weapons were on board. That was the, that was the, the pitch that we had to say about that. It's kind of an open secret because the weapons crew was wearing radiation badges. But nonetheless, the Midway did carry nuclear weapons almost always during her 47 years of active service on active duty from 1945 until 1992. It was a crew of 100 specially trained technicians who tended to the nuclear weapons. The United States Marines that were attached on board, about 150 of them, guarded them with deadly force authorization, and there were only two accesses to the nukes. Life on board an aircraft carrier is dangerous. Life at sea is dangerous. It was a constant companion. Trust, training, and teamwork were very important features to making sure that we actually operated successfully. This is an example of an accident that we had on board the Midway. Fortunately, the pilot walked away from this incident with just some burns on his hands and, and feet, and the flight operations resumed in about four hours. But you can see that what happens is if you come in too low on an aircraft carrier, it can be a disaster. Midway was a Cold War warrior. It was the only ship to serve during the entire Cold War and beyond. It served into the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1992. Russian spy ships often followed the Midway battle groups, as the Chinese do to our ships now. Games of chicken with the Russians were commonplace. Here, a Russian bear aircraft is buzzing the Midway. During her life, she went through three major configurations, and this plan view shows you the outlines of some of those, uh, of all three versions of that, if you will. The straight deck carrier version in the top um, in 1945, in 1955, she was uh, uh, sent to, as many of her sister ships were, to a shipyard to get an angle deck. Why an angle deck? Well, aircraft carrier went from propeller-driven aircraft to jet aircraft. And it would be really important for those heavier jet aircraft to have an angle deck so they could fly straight through in the event of something interfering with their landing and fly around and, and do another take. If you landed straight ahead on a straight deck carrier, you had all the other aircraft parked on the forward end of the ship and it was dangerous. So the angle deck was a big improvement. That happened in 1955. And in 1957, the Midway became a Pacific carrier. Her conversion was done at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And after that, she was home ported in Alameda, California from 1957 until 1974. Uh, the third version down here on the bottom, which you will see um, in a different photograph that will be more illuminating, that was the conversion to the current configuration. We went to four acres of flight deck and converted the Midway to a, to a super carrier, and that happened in 1967 to 1969, a major improvement. There was also another conversion to enable her to fly FA-18, advanced aircraft, prior to Operation Desert Storm. And here's a picture that might be a little more illuminating for you because you can see it a little bit differently from what she actually looked like. So on the left, the straight deck carrier, as she was commissioned, see the guns up forward and all the aircraft parked forward. So every time you landed, all those aircraft were up on the bow and in potential danger of a crash. The second, with the angle deck, you can see the improvement there. That was from the 1950s onward. And in the 1960s, you can see the super carrier configuration of the Midway that carried her through to her to her uh, decommissioning in 1992. Midway made nine Westpac deployments as she was home ported as a Pacific carrier. There were usually six to seven months, a long period of deployment. Uh, she, she deployed as a Pacific carrier on the completion of her conversions, and she was often in the hot spots. If you can remember her, you may remember, some of you are probably old enough, but not many, uh, about an, in, an, a, an incident between China and nationalist China and communist China involving the islands of Quimoy and Matsu between Taiwan. And by the way, these uh, barrier islands are still uh, in controversy between Taiwan and China. We just had an incident last week about that. And the Midway was there. The Midway was there to represent the United States interests in that area. She was home ported in Japan for 18 years. She never came home to the United States for 18 years. She was on the highest level of readiness. And those deployments that she made out of Japan, those, those deployments were on a top level readiness, perhaps not as employment, not, excuse me, not as long a deployment as some of those uh, six to seven month deployments, 
more like a month or two at a time. And, so, and then hot war uh, uh, cropped up in the South, in Southeast Asia, and that was Vietnam about 1965. And the Midway made four deployments in the war on Vietnam. Some of those were before her, her conversion in 1967. Two of them were after that conversion. Midway pilots actually shot down the first and last MiGs of the Vietnam War. Quite a distinction. And you can see there's damage to this aircraft returning to the Midway with um, damage to the wing. In 1975, the Midway was uh, famous for her humanitarian missions. This was one of the most famous. The fall of Saigon in April of 1975. She, this became the largest naval evacuation in, 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 Navy, in the United States Navy's history. The Midway rescued more than 3,000 refugees in her component of this particular evacuation in a little more than 24 hours. Midway sailors gave up their bunks so that families from Vietnam could stay together. Refugees came on board, come on board the Midway today, 40 years later, to find a Midway sailor to say thank you for evacuating us from Vietnam. And then came Operation Desert Storm, perhaps her finest hour. The Midway was the oldest ship involved, and yet magic, Midway magic prevailed once again. She made more combat sorties than any other carrier, including the nuclear aircraft carrier Teddy Roosevelt, which was part of her a battle group. She arrived in the Persian Gulf in fall of 1990, and she left in March of 1991. Admiral March was in command of the task force in the Persian Gulf during this op. There's an interesting photograph in the upper right-hand corner there of the four aircraft carriers that were in the Persian Gulf under the command of Admiral March. And her final mission was another humanitarian mission. It was a volcanic eruption in the Philippines, Mount Pinatubo, the second largest volcanic eruption in the 20th century happened. And the Midway was detailed from Japan to go down and provide power, medical, research, medical assistance and other uh, assistance to those folks in the Philippines. Midway rescued more than 1,800 American personnel with little advance notice. And then she was ordered to go back to the United States for decommissioning. Uh -huh. She did a handoff with the USS Independence in Pearl Harbor and came to San Diego for the first time to be decommissioned in April of 1992. After 47 years of service, she went into the mothballs in Bremerton, Washington, Sinclair Inlet, uh, in the inactive ship facility from 1992 to 2004, she arrested there uh, neglected while the uh, leaders of, the, of San Diego and the Navy uh, raised the funds and secured the permits to bring the Midway to San Diego as a museum. The application was more than 3,000 pages and all kinds of environmental impact that had to be uh, detailed in, in order to, to bring the ship to the, to the San Diego. The Midway opened in San Diego, and it was the first new attraction in 19, excuse me, in 2004, since the, the Wild Animal Park opened in 1972. At last, in January 2004, the Midway became a museum at San Diego. This is the, this is the ship arriving in San Diego with tugs alongside, with a few aircraft on deck, not too many. That's Navy Pier, that's her current berth. And they, they brought her on, on board. And, and uh, she became, she started her, her, her last deployment, if you will, as a, as a museum, as a ship museum. Today, you can live the, the adventure and honor the legend aboard the Midway Museum at Navy Pier. It's a world-renowned museum now. And in fact, since its opening, amazing statistics. Over 3,000 visitors on day one under over 800,000 visitors each year. We went over a million visitors a year in 2012. It dropped below a million during the COVID crisis, but we're back up to a million last year. 15% growth every year. It's the most visited Naval Museum. It's the, 20, it's the 22nd most popular museum of any type in the world, and the fifth most popular museum of any type in the US on TripAdvisor. And that's made possible by 800 volunteers, which contribute a quarter million hours of their volunteer service every year. We have over 18,000 members. <clears throat> Not only are we open every day from 10 o'clock in the morning until five in the evening for visitors to come on board the Midway and see our exhibits, 
But in the evening, we shift to a different scenario. And here you can see the example of a private event that folks who come to uh, San Diego for conventions can rent the Midway out for an evening event. And we serve dinner on the flight deck. Pretty exciting if you ever had a chance to do that. We also provide pro, pro bono uh, opportunities for changes of command, retirements, commissionings, and other military ceremonies to the commands in the, in the San Diego area who perhaps don't have access to a ship facility. And we do that on, with, with great honor, be able to provide that to the military in the San Diego. We have a great relationship with the military. Another aspect of the Midway is our education program. We have a program that we call No Child Left Ashore. And it includes several components. One component is education programs for elementary school students that come on board for programs that are key to the California uh, curriculum. And they learn things like um, electrical systems, weather uh, planning journeys, a lot of stuff about how you do things on board a ship, how science and mathematics is applied in, in the Navy. And it's a very enlightening experience. Uh, most of those uh, folks come from local schools. We also have distance learning and we have programs that we transmit around the country to 48 states about uh, education programs. And we also bring young children on board, um, sometimes as young as, uh, as uh, preschool uh, with their parents, but mostly it's uh, teenagers in the middle school area who spend a night aboard the Midway on Fridays and Saturday nights with escorts and, 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 uh, and chaperones. And we feed them dinner and breakfast on board. And they, put, they, oper, op, they have an opportunity to operate and learn about the Midway on a sort of a scavenger hunt that they do in the evening. And then they learn about the uh, important aspects about service, military service, that freedom isn't free. That you have to make sacrifices for our country to be the country, the greatest country in the world. We're also pretty, uh, pretty sought after by some of the uh, popular television shows. We've, we've, we've hosted American Idol and some other um, interesting shows that have come on board and staged things aboard the Midway. We've even had college basketball games and some other unusual things that have come on board. Wheel of Fortune, Antique Roadshow, Extreme Makeover. They're just a few of the shows that have staged their, their, their presentations on board the Midway. So this next stuff is probably not too... Um, relevant to folks that are in San Dimas, but you can get involved and we would encourage you to come and visit us. We're only 120 miles south of you. And uh, you might wanna become a member, museum member. Uh, we have over 18,000 members and that's really important to our success. Um, you can support the foundation. Midway Foundation supports, supports like-minded organizations that, um, that support uh, military organizations. We also sponsor the Veterans Parade here in San Diego for one thing. And so we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you this evening. And I'd be glad to enter, answer any questions you might have about the Midway Museum. And thanks a lot for having us tonight. Well, thank you, Steve. We, we appreciate that very much. Um, I'm sure there are people who do have questions here. Uh, my first qu my question is um, about the cost as a whole for the uh, daily operations or, or the yearly operation of keeping the Midway afloat. I'm, I'm sure you shoot for an X amount of dollars via donations or grants every year. <laughs> what are you, an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the Midway, the Midway is, a, is an aircraft carrier. It's very expensive to operate. There's no question about it. Uh, it's a nonprofit. It's, it's a nonprofit operates on its own gate. Uh, we get enough admission from our guests that we're able to support the ship on the gate alone, which is the only ship in the world that can do that. But of course, we also get other income from our members. We don't go into too much in the terms of grants, as you may be familiar with museum grants. I also uh, work very uh, closely with the Maritime Museum in San Diego. And the Maritime Museum does a lot of work on grants. The Midway doesn't do that very much because they're able to get more than enough funds to operate their ship from the gate and the membership and the donations. So uh, that's a, it, we have a pretty big budget. I think it's about 24 million a year. And uh, we are successful in being able to put some money into our foundation and then take that foundation money and use it for scholarships, uh, education programs, and other like-minded organizations that we can support locally. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. And then what would it cost to go and see the Midway? It's about 20 bucks. 
uh, I think wow. we just raised uh, raised the prices to I think twenty two dollars. So it's a pretty good deal. Uh, most of the people say, "Oh, I'm just going to pop down to the Midway. I'll be there about an hour, and then I'll leave." And then five hours later, they say, "You know, I haven't seen everything yet. I think I'll stick around a little longer." Oh, wonderful. All right, folks. Question. All right. Raymond's got a question. Yeah, of course. So, uh, uh, Captain, uh, we've got a actually got a uh, Essex class sailor with us today, and I was wondering, right. Barry here served on the uh, USS Kursage. CVS 31, which is Essex class also. And I was well, changed 3133. Did you, uh, did this bring back any memories to you? I, yeah. Come on up here. Tell us what you thought. So Barry, you, you sailed like the late fifties, early sixties. Come on up here and tell us what, what you remember. Well, I was attached to a VS-21 squadron out of North Island in San Diego, but the ship was the USS Kearsarge CBS. You have a CBS and a CBA. A CBS is a support squadron, and that's what we were. We were an anti-submarine squadron. Uh, that's what we were, was a VS-21 anti-submarine squadron. Uh, you go on one carrier, my carrier was older, but they're about the same. They're, they're, they're like a city. Um, when you talk about working up on the air, on the flight deck, uh, that is very dangerous work. And you have to have your mind 24 seven on what you're doing. I, didn't for a second. I was transferring a, an aircraft, moving it because uh, the pilot gave me thumbs down that he couldn't take off. So he told me to get it out of the way. And I was in the process of putting it close to an elevator. And when they turned the prop to turn the plane, I flew off the aircraft. Oh my gosh. And I hit that water and that's like hitting concrete. And um, of course, the Navy was very polite. They uh, got me for destruction of government property <laughs> because I hurt myself. So I destructed government property because they owned me. But <clears throat> uh, it's, it's an experience. Uh, I was in a typhoon aboard that thing and the waves would go over the flight deck area and we had to put posts up towards the front as breakers but after you ride up the first one you're okay it's that first one that kills you but after that first one you're all right i enjoyed it um i saw okinawa philippines japan um, I enjoyed it, and it, it it's like a city. It is what it is, and um, it's an experience. Thanks for your service. Go back. Yeah, yeah, Anyone else? All right, all right, all right. Well, then with that said, thank you very much. Uh, sir, you are more than welcome to stay on, see the rest of this meeting if you'd like. Okay. Otherwise, thank you very much for the presentation. We all very much enjoyed it. So all with that- do this Stop share and you can get on with what you want to do. Well, perfect. All right, wonderful. All right, so back into it. Committee reports. We're looking uh, a little bit about our 29 Palms resupply this past week. We had the uh, Thursday kickoff here, um, and then Saturday, the all day of uh, collecting from various groups that came in. Uh, all in all, I think we got about four, four and a half tons of food. That's us uh, on there at 29 Palms. Um, the day kicked off for some of us way earlier, but for me at 7 a.m. at Masonic Lodge, uh, sheriffs came out, uh, holy name of Mary, um, one of their Veterans Club members, uh, I guess, does drive a semi and was more than willing to uh, come out and 
drop off our uh, the food because we packed it in there. It took us about an hour, well, more than an hour, but yeah. And then uh, we uh, everyone that could go went. That was a couple of sheriffs. We had uh, the sheriff Camaro come out also, which was fun. Uh, Raymond, Mike Wallace, and myself headed on out there. Uh, let's see. We had, um, as you saw that photo, about 20 plus Marines. That's the Masonic Lodge with everything that we had in there. Uh, we had 20 plus Marines help offload, which was wonderful because not quite as many obviously could make the trip. And after they all unloaded, we had lunch. It was wonderful. We presented them with a check at the beginning uh, for five grand. Um, we resupplied their uh, pantry, which is wonderful. Yeah, we got to keep going. All right. Um, with that, that's about the gist of it for that day, which seems very small compared to how long the day took. <laughs> Um, let's see. My secretary report. Is that you? Is that it's me? Yeah. All right. Well, you're up, Hanson. Go right ahead. Well, secretary report. It's you. Secretary report. It's you. Okay. So the club itself had the board meeting. Uh, almost all the dues are caught up for the year. We'll be going into the new year. Rotary year is, begins June, July, and that's you'll take your second year's chair. Mm -hmm. Isabella will be going in as a uh, second year as secretary. Uh, Steve uh, Scott, our current treasurer, will become president of the Rotary Club. I'll become past president and, be, and I'm gonna take the job of secretary. Uh, we've already got speakers into July and August of this caliber for your club. And during the noon club, we have fabulous speakers on different subjects and everyone is invited to all of those meetings. Um, to tailgate a little bit about the, is okay to talk about the yeah, food drive? Yeah. We took five tons of food out to 29 Palms. For those of you who don't know, 22,000 active duty military families, 213,000 National Guard reservists, and 1.2 million veterans are on SNAP. They receive federal food assistance. They suffer from food insecurity. Many of our major military installations have, come on in, have uh, food pantries, including 29 Palms. And 29 Palms is our nation's largest military facility. It's 1,500 square miles the size of Rhode Island. 10,000 Marines, 1,000 sailors and their families. And they have a food pantry for those families, for the junior enlisted. We took five tons of food out to them and $5,000. Now, we raised $15,000 in this food drive. That's the good news. And so one of the things we've talked about doing, we've secured permanently transportation now through United Pumping Service. That was the man who brought out the big tractor trailer. He's a member of the military uh, ministry at Holy Name of Mary called the Stars and Stripes Club. He's committed to us. We've also got Habitat for Humanities committed their stake bed trucks to us and some warehouse space. So we're working on a permanent solution, not only for Two Nine Palms, but for Pendleton and Fort Irwin. And we now we've got a, a Connex trailer a 40-foot trailer, we're going to take out the 29 palms that they'll use for storage. It'll triple their storage capacity, allowing us to stock them once a year now, rather than having to do it twice a year. So that's the next project we're working on uh, for your club. Our next scheduled food drive will be September 30th. Um, but once we get this worked out, how we're going to do it, I think that this time was like the American Legion It'd be nice to get like the next drive, just the VFW or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the Marine Corps League detachments involved. We'll see how it goes. Are there any questions about the food drive and what we did? Yeah. Yes. I, oh, did you say they, they don't honor veterans? They are veterans that are receiving the active duty. The, though these are active duty. active duty families. So in other words, they make so little that they're on basically the food assistance. Yeah, and now so... And and I, and I and I think all of us who are veterans, enlisted veterans, want to make this real clear. When I joined up, I enlisted at 16 and went to boot camp at 17. You were 17 or 18? 18. 18. You were 17. 17. They hired us at 17 years old to be E4 and below, pointy end of the stick or chip paint guys. They did not hire me to get married and have a family. I chose to do that. And so I had to pawn my trumpet to make rent occasionally. So the military, in their defense, hires young people to be in the military. Their, their life choices sometimes impact what they do. We still want to support them, but we don't want to lay this off completely on the military. They don't make a lot of money, 
but they're not supposed to make a lot of money. Does that make sense? And how many how many guys bought giant stereos? Cars. Cars, motorcycles. cars, motorcycles, giant stereos, because you're single. Man, you got a lot of money. If you get a wife and you get a family, and then you get in the at the Marine Corps at 29 Palms, they do 40 to 50 baby showers a month. Okay, so the Marines are busy out there, right? <laughs> and they're young people, and that's what you expect them to do. So we're supporting them as they serve our country um, by providing, by stocking the food bank. But everybody gets surprised. Why is this happening? Why aren't we paying them enough? I believe we probably do pay them enough, but we want to support them in the life choices that they make. Does that make sense? Other questions about that? that was a good question. Okay, that's all I had. All right. Fantastic. Wonderful secretary report. With that said, don't get too comfortable, Raymond, because you're the one that knows everything about the 2026 committee. You're the man in charge, so. Way back up there? Yeah, I mean, that's that's all you. That's that's You're the guy in charge of it. Tw yeah, I want to pull up your calendar, too. You got it. And 2026 committee does seem far out, but it is a big project that's going on. So we've been talking about it since last year. I don't know anything about a raffle. But that's a new one. No, that's that's our list. Yeah, that's what I thought. So the 2026 committee is the committee formed in the city of San Dimas to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence here in our city. What are we going to do? Uh, if you are a, live in San Dimas and you'd like to participate in that committee, you need not be a Rotarian. There are many different city uh, groups participating in that. You also have me down here for the USMC benefit dinner. November 10th is the dinner. We're beginning to work on it. There is your calendar. Um, you can see the next speakers up there. But you've got great speakers. You're the yellow ones. Right. So, yes, uh, we'll obviously keep up with the USMC dinner committee. We're just going to keep talking about those two forever, it seems like. 2026 committee and the benefit committee for that November 10th deal. Um, as you can see in yellow, that's what we have for our upcoming speakers. And that was our calendar as a whole. All right. With that said, four-way test. Who wants to do it this week? Man, right here, get on up here. Uh, I don't know. I had key. I don't think I have my copy. Copy my office. No, no, you don't. Okay, fine, 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 fine. Raymond. Yeah. You haven't spoken enough yet, so come on up here and do a four-way test. Well, the four-way test says thirteen to read it. You got it. You go. Got it for you. There you. There it is. The Rotary's four-way test is a way to look at life. And then it disappears. Now, the things we say and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And this is the basis of a proper contract. They benefit everybody. They're fair to everybody. And, of course, building goodwill and friendships is always an advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And with that said, my closing remarks. Uh, thanks for everyone that came out. Um, there's a laundry list of people that you can thank between all the different clubs. Like as he was saying, we have we had the LA County Sheriffs, we had mostly American Legion, we'd like to see the Marine Corps League, all the people that came out. Uh, here we had individuals bringing in food. Uh, this year, was a little more skewed except towards diapers we were skewed towards food so that's wonderful for us um you know it was like i said we said it was a long day but very very wonderful to have because when you go and you drop it off and you see it you know you, you it's a bunch of young kids that you know i was at 29 palms when i started my time in the marine corps and i get to look back on geez look how young they look and remember like okay that's right but some to raymond's point some of these folks do start families and you know it's their market it's kind of set up like a little market it's a very small room but People are able to go inside and uh, pull food for the family, and that's just wonderful for us to be able to have. And as we're going along, um, we had discussed uh, figuring out how to get a way to barcode everything so that we can see what actually moves over there, what we're dropping off. And then this is something that we're looking to expand, as Raymond had pointed out, to Camp Penn, uh, Fort Irwin, so on and so forth. And then if we can take this up into different uh, states, that'd be even better. So... With all that, thanks to everyone. We really do appreciate you guys coming out and doing all that you could do. So that you guys have a great night. Thanks for coming out.